I really needed a nice quiet place to record, so I might just shoot this entire YouTube video in my car. What's up guys, I'm Christy with Oak Hill Millworks and today I want to talk to you about five things that I wish I was aware of before I got a CNC. Let's jump in. Okay, so number one, dust collection. You need a fair amount of dust collection when you're doing CNC projects because it makes a lot of sawdust. Now when I say need, you don't really need. You could go without it. You could clean up kind of in between jobs and after with a shop vac or whatever you have. Um, but I think you might be happier with dust collection. And what I will say, um, there's a lot of options out there, a lot of ways you could do this. Um, if you're going to be working with MDF, that's gonna cause a huge mess. It's that the little fibers, they get everywhere. It's really bad for you to breathe in. So you need to consider the area you're working in, dust collection, maybe even wearing a mask if you're not going to have great dust collection and you intend to be around the machine while it's working, especially if it's in like a small enclosed area. Um, a lot of people do the dust separators. Um, I know Dust Right makes one or Dust Deputy, um, two different variations that you can kind of DIY your own dust collection with a separator involved so that the fine particles don't clog the filter on your suction. Um, I have the large DC50 from Bucktool unit and right now that's what I'm using but I'm not sure if that's a permanent setup for me. I also picked up the dust right uh, cyclone thingy. I'll put the link for it in the description below on Amazon if you want to check it out. That's a good option. Um, but other than that, yeah, just consider dust collection before you just jump into the world of CNC. There's some cool accessories that Onefinity sells, um, like a dust boot that will help with your tubing and great accessories on Etsy by Rowdy Roman Fire. He has this sweet dust boom that goes out over your spoil board and allows your hose to pivot back and forth. Um, and then he makes these nice Z clips that go on the Z slider mount and um, just put your tube right where you need it. So check those out. I'll put a link for Rowdy Roman Fire's Etsy page in the description below as well. All right, that brings me to number two, bits. Bits is something that I didn't really think about more so in terms of the cost. So you buy your CNC, you, you know, you might have a price tag of 3,000 bucks, 2,500 bucks, 3,000 or more, depending on what make and model you bought. And then you kind of forgot to think about, oh yeah, the added cost of bits. Um, I think there's a few that you can buy to get started with, and I'm no expert here, but I would recommend having a nice uh, bit for V carving, like a 90 degree or a 30 or 60 degree V carving bit um, is a good one to get started with, as well as a quarter inch end mill. There are two main kinds there that most people use, uh, a down cut or an up cut. And both of those, they seem like they would do the same thing and you're kind of wondering like, what what's the difference here between down cut and up cut? Well, it more so has to do with the chips and where they're gonna go while it's rotating. So. Um, a down cut is going to be more likely to push down and the chips are going to stay down so you might generate more heat with a down cut. But um, with that, like you need to use a down cut if you're going to put any type of film or masking on top to cut through. Otherwise, using an up cut with that would kind of shred that and then you wouldn't have a clean paint job. So, But if you're going to do like hole boring or things where you're just pushing down constantly, you probably want to use an up cut to avoid that heat generation and make sure nothing's going to start burning. If you wanted to do finer detail carvings or detail work with the CNC, you need to consider getting an eighth inch bit or even, they make even smaller ones, just drop my keys. There's a whole world of bits out there. Suffice it to say, I don't know everything about them. 
but go check them out. A brand that I see a lot of people using that's not going to break the bank, but isn't going to like snap on you and cause a horrible disaster are the uh, white side bits. So you can get those from companies like Bits and Bits or uh, Tools Today, a variety of Amazon. Um, I'll link them. I don't have very many of them. I have a few and I will link the ones that I do have. Uh, okay, number three, I would say you need to consider the space that you're going to put this CNC in. As you can tell, I'm wearing a snow cap. I live in Pennsylvania and winters can be pretty harsh here. So I believe, and I could be wrong on this, but I believe Onefinity recommends operating their machine at or above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Not sure what that is in Celsius for all you Canadians out there, eh? Eh? That was bad. Okay, but um, so you have to consider the environment you're working in. Mine is out in our garage and it's not insulated and not heated. Um, so that can create a problem because once you turn on that machine and the control box starts generating heat, if that heat mixes with cold air, there's a chance you could have a condensation buildup in the wiring. And I'm no electrician, but most of us know that water near electrical is no bueno. So, uh, just keep that in mind. I did see some rather unique solutions or potential solutions to this problem that I'm going to explore myself further. Um, one cool YouTube video, I'll, I'll link it here, uh, showed basically building like a small containment box around the control box, um, to keep the control box in and the screen that comes with the Onefinity and using a reptile lamp to uh, heat that small area and keep it around 50 degrees using a thermocoupler or a thermocouple. So um, that's a unique and inexpensive way that could potentially keep that temperature at a constant uh, level that's gonna be safe for the machine to operate under. And you know, maybe it'll be fine running it in 30 degree weather, but I'm not sure I wanna find out if it's not fine. All right, number four, computer, operating system, technology. What technology do you need to be able to run a CNC? So it's important to consider your computer or what technology you're gonna use to operate the CNC because some design softwares and some post-processors need uh, certain bit systems, like a 64-bit operating system in order to function. Um, I was talking with someone recently and they said, oh man, I just got a Chromebook for Christmas. Um, and I'm realizing that some of these design softwares don't work with Chromebook. So that's a problem. Um, you're, you're going to want to be able to design and then have some sort of post-processing software that can turn your designs into G-code. We'll get you know what? Let's save that for another bullet point. My point is, do your research. Um, decide what you're going to be using to design your work and export your work into G-Code and make sure you have the correct computer setup to be able to handle that. Just something I can't, not an expert on the topic, but I'm just going to point you in that direction and say, make sure you do your homework, especially considering like uh, Mac versus PC you know, there's always something there. So double check. All that talk about computers really brings me to point number five, which is consider what you're designing with before you get your CNC. Maybe you haven't ordered your CNC yet. Maybe you're waiting a couple weeks for it to come in. This is a great time to be nailing down your software that you're going to be using, getting to know it, practicing, you know, get get yourself set up for success before your machine even comes. Because once your machine comes, you're going to want to use it. But then you might realize, oh, wait, I have to know how to design files and do tool paths. These tool paths everyone's talking about, speeds and feeds, and it starts to get a little overwhelming. So while you're waiting for your CNC to come in, or if you already have it, whatever, Take the time to do your research on different programs you can use. Here are some of the most popular that I hear people are using. Some free ones like Carbide Create, Easel, 
And then other paid options, things like VCarve, VCarve Pro, or even for people who want to get into 3D carving and some really intricate stuff, they go with Aspire. So just do your homework, see what is free, see what is paid for. Some of these software programs can get pretty pricey. You may want to start with a free one just to get your toes wet and start designing simple things. A really great person to check out on YouTube, this is a sidebar, is Mark Lindsay, and he recommends starting easy. Don't cannonball, dip your toes in, cut a circle out, you know, and call that a win because there's a lot to learn here. I personally got VCarve Pro. Um, Onefinity CNC was kind enough to both send me out my machine to learn and to create content, hopefully to inspire others to dive into the world of CNC ownership. Um, and they were kind enough to support me with the purchase of my software with my post processor and everything in that. And so what I mean by post processor is that's what you need to turn your vector or your design into G code. What is G code you ask? Great question. G-code is what the CNC language is, basically. Um, that's what your design is translated into to tell the router how to carve it. So um, if you are already familiar with a design software that you really like and you can export as an SVG or a DXF file, those are two great files to work with to send to a post processor to make it easy to then create your G-code. So for me, now I didn't I didn't have any intentions of bringing this up but I'm a laser operator primarily. I know this is a CNC video but I started with the laser um, so my laser company works primarily with a software called CorelDRAW and not a lot of people use it but my tech support does so that's what matters to me. Um, so I'm really familiar with how to design in CorelDRAW. So what I'm going to plan to do is continue to design in CorelDRAW and export my files as an SVG or a DXF and then open it in my VCarve Pro and get it set up the way that that software needs it. Because to start from scratch with design in VCarve Pro, which is totally possible, but from my beginner's perspective, I'm just seeing that as limiting. When I compare my design software, CorelDRAW, with VCarve Pro in terms of just the design capabilities, I feel like my hands are tied in VCarve Pro. And I'm not as familiar with it, that's for sure. But I like using the keyboard controls um, as well as my mouse to speed up design. And I'm not seeing a lot of those shortcuts in VCarve Pro. It's a lot of like getting to know menus and clicking and dragging. And it just seems a little bit, It I think it's just really more for setting up your tool paths and getting that G code generated. So that's the good news, I guess, if you're already familiar with something like Adobe Illustrator or um, anything that can, any design software that can export an, as an SVG, you're gonna be a couple steps ahead of the game. So that's the good news. And then once you open it up in your post processor, you'll, you'll learn how to set up your tool paths. And really that just means tell the computer where the router needs to move and it, you'll just ultimately have to start playing with your software and see how it works. That's what I did. Watched a couple YouTube videos on VCarve Pro and quickly learned how to do profile cuts, pocket cuts, and V-carves. Um, and I was on my way. So when you hear about speeds and feeds, chances are you're going to feel a little bit like, what? Like I was. Um, if you're buying a Onefinity CNC, when you buy V-carve Pro, you actually choose your CNC... <laughs> So scratch that. No matter what CNC you have, if you buy VCarve Pro, when you go to set it up, it'll have you choose your machine, the make and model, from a drop-down menu. And that'll allow your post processor to communicate specifically with your CNC. And for me, I was able to have a preset list of 
bits, all their descriptions, safe speeds, safe feeds for them to run at. And they're just suggested guidelines. You will have to operate your machine ultimately and take some notes and see if you can push it a little faster or if you need to pull it back a little bit. But that's the name of the game. There's a lot of learning with uh, getting new equipment, new tools. So the best thing you can do is do your research, operate it as safely as you can, because remember, this is a high powered tool that your chances are you're going to break a bit at some point. And if you're in the area when that bit breaks, it's got to go somewhere. So be careful. Um, I hope this was helpful to consider all of these things, hopefully in advance of getting a CNC, just so you can stay uh, ahead of the curve and preparing on your new adventure with your new CNC. So if you like this video today, please hit that subscribe button, hit the bell so you can stay in the loop, uh, give this video a like. And this was kind of, this was on the longer side of a video for me at this point. So if you made it this far, I want you to comment raccoon just to prove that you watched the whole video through. Hopefully you didn't just skip to the end. But if you did, I'm glad you're here regardless. Stay tuned for more CNC videos. I plan to share um, how to work through a design and send it to the CNC in the future. But for right now, this is what I had for you for today. Hope you guys have an awesome rest of your week. Stay safe out there and have some fun. I cannot believe I just ran through that entire video in the car. I'm certain I didn't hit all the points that I wanted to, but it was a good practice run through, if nothing else. All right, let's go inside. It's kind of fun in the car, my dirty car. It's great. <laughs>